Without further ado, I would like to present to you our next program, which is a fireside chat with the title, India, Southeast Asia, and the Future of Tech. I give you Shailendra Singh, Managing Director of Sequoia Capital India, and David Corbin, Director of Content Strategy at Tech in Asia. Welcome, Shailendra and David. Okay, I'll admit it. The chair, the couch idea thing was mine. <laughs> I liked the idea of two people on a couch. Now that I'm sitting in this chair, I agree the chair is a little bit more comfortable. I apologize to all the speakers who I made sit on those couches. Uh, <laughs> welcome, Shailendra. Thank you for joining us here today. Uh, in just like your own words, uh, how would you uh, describe what you do every day? Sure. Um Actually, before that, uh, I requested for these chairs, so I'll take credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Because I saw some photos from yesterday, and I saw people looking very uncomfortable sitting on a couch together. Um, I thought it was too close to comfort. And uh, before I start, you know, I was just off offered alcohol backstage. And I want you guys to know that I did not drink it. Uh, so I, I can't make the over. same guarantee. I, I've actually never had alcohol. But uh, uh, hi, everyone. I'm Shalendra. I work for Sequoia Capital. I've had the good fortune to, be, to work at the firm roughly 10 years. And uh, what do I do every day? Uh, on a daily basis, my day job is to work alongside founders and um, you know, go through the ups and downs of company building. And um, uh, I have more scars in my body and more broken bones, and, and I've healed uh, than, than uh, you could possibly imagine over the last 10 years. So that's what I do. OK, so I hope we can talk a little bit about your history over those past 10 years. Uh, but first, I think uh, every time that we uh, kind of talk about Sequoia, there's definitely a certain buzz. Uh, and I think that's because uh, you guys are one of the very, very few uh, originally uh, Silicon Valley based companies that are active uh, in, in Asia and certainly in Southeast Asia. So my first question to you is, all these other very smart uh, VCs, they're all looking at the same data. But you guys say, well, you know, there's, you're missing something. And so far, it looks like you guys ha have definitely found uh, the piece that everyone else was missing. So what, what is that piece? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, you know, that presupposes that we are right, uh, which we don't presuppose. <laughs> but, I, I would like to presuppose. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but, uh, but I, I will say that, um, you know, we started thinking about Southeast Asia actually four years ago. And we were guided into Southeast Asia by the early success of some of our existing portfolio companies. So we started to see some companies you know, come to these markets and get some early success. And we started to say, hey, these markets look quite similar to the emerging market trends we saw in India. And that sort of really gradually got us drawn in. But to be very candid, I don't think it's an analytical decision uh, to be in Southeast Asia or not. Because you know, if you said, oh, you know, how many unicorns are there? Or, oh, how many dollars of exits have been generated? It would be very easy to look at the data of the past and say, we should wait and not do anything yet. But I think our business, and we try to, we try to do the same thing we tell founders to do, and, and you know, we try to bring the same mindset to a board meeting that we bring to our own business, which is that fundamentally, whether it is building a startup or it is for us to come to Southeast Asia, it's the same. It's about you know, taking good and calculated risks, and more than anything else, having conviction that you know, be, being willing to live with failure. So you know, when we came here, candidly, we didn't know if we'd be right at the time. And we feel great today. But you know, it's still early. And I'd say, candidly, we were just willing to believe more uh, while the data was no different. And I think it's the same mindset with which people become founders. And it's the same mindset with which we think people should invest, um, which is to not, you know, data only tells you a very small part of a, of a company's um, uh, call it uh, value. So let's talk about the, the investment decision-making process. Sure. Is this something which is kind of handled entirely locally? Is it something you discuss uh, with the US team as well? Or even with, like, say, the China team? Like, How do these decisions actually get made? Yeah, every firm works differently. Um, at Sequoia, we are very highly um, empowered locally. Uh, in general, what happens is that local teams in every geography can recommend decisions. And you know they will go up. Uh, they, they will go up to to be being discussed 
you know, with, with in this case, we are part, the India and Southeast Asia is sort of part of one fund. So it's discussed with the India Investment Committee, but then it's also on a weekly basis discussed with our partners in the, in the Bay Area. But I think the bias at Sequoia always is to back the judgment of the local team. So, you know, again, it's a, it's a trusting and believing mindset mm -hmm. uh, because of which I think Sequoia has successfully nurtured businesses, it's their own businesses in, in different parts of the world. And then even within those local teams, is this a situation where you make the decision, like you're, you're a partner, you like this company, you pull the trigger, or is this something where you have to get the buy-in uh, of all the other partners as well? H how does that work? Same way. So at Sequoia, if a partner really wants to make, a dis make an investment, and the, f the phrase we, we use is, um, you know, if they're really willing to put their neck on the line and they're pounding the table and said, look, I really have belief, you know, chances are that people will back them. It is, it is not frequently that people, you know, the investment committee or the other partners will stand in their way. And again, the reason, the reason is very simple. We believe, you know, the best parts um, of a startup can't be measured. So people think, hey, metrics will tell you the story and unit economics will tell you the story and, and so on and so forth, which is true. But, you know, founder's clarity you can't measure. You know, the love of, for a product you can't easily measure. The testimonials are qualitative. The enthusiasm of a team, their passion, their commitment, you can't measure. And so what we believe is, you know, investing in startups and going through the startup process is a very sensory process. So the, the people on the front line can sense these things and say, oh, I love this founder because, you know, this guy is so deeply committed. And, you know, yesterday you guys heard from Practo. I think that's a terrific mm -hmm. story of when we invested in Practo, there were less than 10 people in the company and almost insignificant amounts of revenue. And we made a small seed investment. And candidly, it was Shashank who was so special and his co-founder and their simple product with immense clarity. Now, if I made a spreadsheet and I said, hey, this company can become very big, people would argue, you know, uh, the largest healthcare technology company in India at the time does not even have $5 million of revenue. You know, how are you going to build a big company? And I think that's, that's where sort of you have to take that leap of faith mm -hmm. and have that sensory ability to say, you know what, this founder is so special. If there's one healthcare company I want to back, I want to back this one. So I want to talk about this idea of the special founder. Yeah. Uh, of course, there's this concept of determination uh, and just kind of charisma. They can lead a team. They can build sure. a culture. Uh, are there any other uh, points that you would define as like, these are some signs that this is a founder who can go the distance, yeah. uh, who can really build a great company? Yeah, it's actually very interesting. You know, we, we have something we call the founder's DNA at Sequoia. And, um, um, you know, the founder's DNA, we, we think, has many elements to it. But, you know, the best founders we've found, and I'll take the example now of William of Tokopedia, you know, they will bring such an extraordinary level of commitment and idealism to the table and sort of hold the purpose much higher than themselves. For example, that is a very rare but very, very remarkable attribute. When you have a what we call a missionary founder, a, a person on a mission. It's their life's mission. It's not about building a company. It's not about selling it. It's not, not about economics. It's not about how much money they, they, they raise. They are truly and deeply convinced that they want to devote their lives to a mission. If that exists, and you know, if they're capable, they've found product market fit. You know, um, increasingly, what we do at Sequoia is we'll ask ourselves, do we like the market? We shouldn't overthink it. So this idea of the, the truly driven founder, you've been here for, I think, around 10 years so far. Right. Uh, and so that means you've really seen uh, a lot of ups and downs yes. in, in, in the ecosystem. <laughs> yes. uh, when you talk about this kind of uh, very, very driven founder, is that something that is more easily found in a down period or an up period? Yeah, I mean, uh, very good question. Uh, clearly, the down period tests a founder's conviction, and it also tests investors' conviction. And there's a reason they say that, you know, the best companies come out in downturns because, you know, it's not fashionable to be a founder in a downturn. And the guys who are really digging in, um, you know, it demonstrates great proof. I tweeted about this last week, I think, which is that, you know, it's actually very hard to imagine. Imagine a company that did not go through a downturn or adversity and did not, was not truly tested. Could such a company ever really build a good culture? Could people really ever go through, I mean, and you can relate it to everyday life. Imagine somebody had a very cushy life, you know, got lots of money from the time they were a kid and grew up. You know, what would you find they were culturally like versus, versus somebody who had been tested repeatedly and had, you know, come up, come up through personal, call it um, uh, accomplishment and so on and so forth. So, you know, I always equate startups to people 
And I, you know, I think a startup has a character and a personality, much like an individual. And the same principles apply. So I actually think founders and companies that do go through down cycles will come out of them, you know, like they say, what, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Mm -hmm. They'll come out much stronger. They'll come out more grounded. They'll come out with greater belief in their ability. And they'll come out having pushed themselves to really, really pressure test the value proposition, the value they deliver, and so on and so forth. So on balance, yes, you know, a downturn, when, when, when founders uh, take the downturn head on and will come out on the other side better off, that's a great sign that you know, uh, the character building process has sort of uh, resulted in, a, in, a, in some of the long term, call it this, this person can now go the full distance. Mm -hmm. So I understand what you're saying there. And then when we look at the upturn, yeah. uh, especially, let's just take now this current upturn. There's such a proliferation of information yeah. <laughs> about how to do a pitch, right. how to think about your metrics. Right. Uh, it's if you are a little bit determined, you can definitely learn how to say all the right things in the right way. <laughs> yeah. And you know, sell me this pen. Like you can you can get people to do that. Correct. So how do you see through that kind of sheen? Is it just an issue of really taking a relationship slowly and seeing how someone is behaving over say six months? How how do you uh, cut through all that? So I think one of the key tenets that we look for in founders is authenticity. And I always counsel founders, my own founders where I serve on the boards, and I always tell them, look, don't oversell your company to investors. Don't exaggerate your metrics to anyone. Don't say, if you raise 10 million, don't say 15 to the press. And I also joke with them saying, guys, you know, $3 million does not round off to $10 million announcement, <laughs> right? I, I know you guys are pretty smart. Yeah. It just does not round off to 10. So, yeah, yeah, so you know, yeah. hold off on all those things. And I think, you know, the, the, the folks who are authentic, you know, you can see their authenticity. And you can see it in their actions. You can see it in the sets of events that led them to the point, mm -hmm. you know, in an up, up cycle. So it's not just that they are founders in an up cycle, but what did they do before? Mm -hmm. And I actually always tell founders, when you oversell your company or you exaggerate metrics, you actually put the VC in a lose-lose situation. Mm -hmm. Because if I believe you, I could be screwing up. If I don't believe you, I could also be screwing up. Um, so, you know, then it, then it actually makes it much harder for people to engage. And, um, but, but you know, our belief at Sequoia is good founders will found companies in good and bad markets. So we don't take the point of view that we should be investing in an up cycle and not investing in a down cycle and so on and so forth. If anything, we would want to be as contrarian as possible and want to, uh, but, but in general, we try to keep as steady a pace. We try to not worry about today's point in time view of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, upturns and downturns are basically people saying, oh, it's hot now or, you know, oh, there's no money now, and therefore, or, you know, it's tough now. Mm -hmm. But, you know, no success is created in one or two years. So the reality is every good company has to go through a few down cycles in their 10, 15, 20-year journey. Is that something which uh, LPs readily understand? Because you're a very founder-first organization. Yes. Uh, but sometimes the LPs don't necessarily always have perfect alignment on that point. Uh, so how do you do that kind of juggling uh, trick between the two sides. Yeah, I think we are a little spoiled at Sequoia because candidly most of our LPs have a multi-decade relationship with Sequoia. Mm -hmm. And so I think they've also seen us through many cycles. Right. And clearly the smarter LPs and the more educated and sophisticated LPs would all prefer that we are contrarian. And you know, being consistent in investment philosophy is pro probably more time tested than trying to play cycles. We're not a public market investor or somebody who's trying to say, oh, in an up cycle, I should quickly exit. In a down cycle, I should buy, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. I think you know, our focus is going to be, do we like an industry? Do we think it's going to transform itself? Do we have a person and a team that can transform it? And you know, do we see ourselves play an important role as their partner and take a five, ideally 10, 15 year view, as long a view as possible? And then it doesn't matter what's happening in the outside world, whether you know, these days it's easy to raise the B or the C round. I've learned over these years, candidly, the first principles is the only thing that matters. If you have a good company in any market, you can raise money for it. And if you have a bad company, even in a good market, you can't raise money for it. And even if you do raise money for it, it'll still go down. Because it was already a bad yeah, company. So I, I, there is no substitute. The only thing that works is build real value, you know, have a good culture, have a strong team, and you know, do the right things for the very long term. Much so, of the else is noise. So when we talk about this kind of, so since, gosh, ever since like the, the mini China crash, 
back in late summer last year, uh, we've been saying winter is coming. I don't know what people would say if Game of Thrones didn't exist, but winter is coming, winter is coming, winter is coming. So it's been like eight months. Yeah. Either winter is here or, or it's not. Yeah. Uh, and for your perspective, since you sit on the board of some of the uh, kind of most influential companies in both India as well as uh, Indonesia and, and Singapore, do you s see uh, the effects of this so-called winter differently in, say, the India market versus the Southeast Asia market? Uh, what, what's that look like to you? Yeah, I think, you know, first, uh, there was a period of extreme euphoria mm -hmm. and uh, lots of irrational exuberance around you know, investors and founders, you know, making choices that were very tactical in nature, where they were pursuing growth at any cost, sacrificing unit economics and so on and so forth. And candidly, I think every person is guilty of that uh, in the ecosystem. Um, even those who say, oh, we are so cautious and so on and so forth, you know, I can tell you they were felt, they, they would, they would privately admit last year they felt they were missing out, <laughs> <laughs> you know, at the time. Yeah. I think the, the thing with the investment business is, you know, in hindsight, it's very easy to call everything. And, um, you know, at the, po at the point in time, it's actually very tough to make choices. Um, but, but, you know, coming back to winter is coming. Look, you know, I think the markets have corrected a fair bit. Uh, I'm personally very positively surprised by how quickly companies have been able to turn around their unit economics. Mm -hmm. Not everyone, but many of them. And this is good. I mean, you know, this is truly not winter. This is a real market where people are tested to go build a real company. And um, lots of companies are still getting capital. We're not seeing a you know, market um, a meltdown, if you will. Uh, we think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's tougher than last year, mm -hmm. but is it dramatically tougher than 10 years on average? Probably not. You know, maybe 10, 10 20% tougher than the 10-year average yeah. to raise capital. It feels like a steep drop from a euphoric market. Of course, of course. Quick follow-up question. Are you looking forward to the new season of Game of Thrones? Absolutely. Okay, okay. <laughs> I watched every one of them. I know, it's so good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll talk more about that later. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, uh, when we're talking about, about India, uh, part of this kind of coming down from the euphoria, euphoria is that uh, now we see some commentators saying, you know, maybe the potential in India isn't as large as we think it is because... Yeah. I think it was uh, Mahesh Murthy who had uh, a pretty long article saying things like, you know, uh, in China, uh, other companies can become the Google of China, the Facebook of China. In India, the Google yeah. of India is Google, et cetera. Yeah. And so that is one sign uh, that the, the actual potential for enormous growth is a bit more limited. Uh, but somewhere between like the euphoria of like, India will just take over the world and like, oh, India, it would be so hard, it would be so hard. Uh, where do you think is a more realistic way to kind of gauge uh, the, the potential of that market? Yeah, look, first, I think India is a really tough market. You know, India is amongst, you know, on a per capita GDP basis, a really poor country. That's the reality of India. And uh, therefore, purchasing power is still very limited. Um, you know, but that being said, India will secularly go up. You know, it won't go up because of any magical thing people do. It'll go up because of the low base effect. It'll go up in spite of all the things that will go wrong there, <laughs> candidly. So I think first, people who invest in emerging markets like myself, again, I think point in time views are very, very um, limiting. And the question very simply is, what are we all investing for? Are you investing for a two year return or are you investing for 2030? Mm -hmm. I did a presentation recently to our LPs. In 2030, India is forecast to have roughly $7 trillion of GDP. That's almost 75% of China's GDP today. A new investment we make this year in 2016, or let's say next year in 17, and if you hold 10, 12 years, by the time we are exiting it, you know, we'll be pretty close to that, that time period. By the way, Southeast Asia is forecast to have another $7 trillion of GDP. Mm -hmm. And it just depends on the time horizon you have in mind. Um, I think, uh, I'm very confident about one thing. When I look back at 2006, I look back at, at coming to Singapore, I think I attended an event here for the first time in 11 or 12, um, I forget. I forget when now. And I look at today. You know, who in this room is not positively surprised by how far we have come, how quickly, right? And the same applies to India. In 2006 versus now, most of us couldn't have imagined that we'd have such a big, thriving ecosystem. Nobody could have imagined that a company could raise billions of dollars, mm -hmm. you know? It was unfathomable. Actually, not just in India, anywhere in the world, five or seven years ago. So I think 
this phenomena of smartphones fundamentally transforming emerging markets is a very real phenomena. Mm -hmm. We think that the 10, 15 year outlook is very robust. We are, we are investing for that. And uh, you know, there'll be plenty of bumps along the way. And look, if it were all smooth sailing, candidly, it would not be fun. And then it would be too easy for everybody to, to just participate in a straight linear curve up. Yeah. So we welcome all these bumps. You know? <laughs> I think the, the best founders welcome these bumps. I've had multiple founders say, Shailendra, this is a phenomenal time. We are, ha we are making so much progress. There is no competitive tension. Attrition has stopped. People are committed. We have our head down. We are loving the company building process. So founders who have the right mindset and values and the teams that have their product market fit are loving it. You know, they're having a blast. So I want to talk about this idea of putting the head down, building the company. Yeah. Uh, that obviously is going to be hard, and that's where you find your real character in the downtime. Uh, and you said earlier how in the past you you have your share of bumps and bruises and, oh, and scars. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm wondering, from your perspective as an investor and as an advisor to some of these companies, uh, what are some of the companies that we see now, and they look perfect, and you think, my goodness, oh, I wish I could you know, be that founder or, or be in that company. Yeah. What are some of these companies that look amazing now but really had to fight to get to this point? Yeah. So look, first, uh, what, I'd, what I'd say to the founders in general is, Everything that seems so rosy on the outside, you know, a company is a unicorn, they just raised $100 million, you know, a company raised a Series A or a Series B, you know, that's very rosy from afar, you know. Inside the building, the chances, chances are it is chaotic. It, if, especially if it's fast growing, it's very chaotic. It's dealing with all the growing pains. Chances are they're making a lot of mistakes. And you know what, it's okay. That's how companies scale. Companies are, no, no company is born perfect with great systems, metrics, ability to understand even their own business, the perfect business model, the perfect pricing plan, the perfect go-to-market, the perfect financial, I mean, never happens, right? The best of companies, um, when you, and I think this is what you learn as a VC candidly, what you learn is how to calibrate, you know, how broken is broken, you know, um, and um, how to calibrate good and bad data. So I think, Coming back, right, all the companies that look great today have gone through a huge set of challenges. And if they hadn't, you know, overcome those challenges, they wouldn't be good to begin with today. So, you know, it's overcoming those, those challenges that actually makes them strong and good. Like free charge is a great example. We had a very, uh, very positive outcome in free charge last year, Snapdeal acquired it. I led the Series A round. And then right after we invested, you know, the tech platform basically just melted. Uh, can, you, can you elaborate? Yeah, we couldn't spend on marketing. We couldn't grow the company. And, uh, you know, we were using an old tech platform that was just very poorly architected. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Company had to go look for a new CTO. Uh, the CTO they hired left in the middle of creating the new platform after four or five months. And then, and then you know, they were now with a, somewhere in a platform transition without the leader. And the founder was not an engineer himself. And it was a very tough uh, transition. And then... You know, company went through 18 months very tough uh, when even cash ran out and we did a small interim round with some friendly investors and so on and so forth. And then when things started to come together and we recruited a strong tech team, we recruited a bunch of product people, you know, when it took off, then it grew 40x within the year. How um, long did they not have a CTO? Several quarters. Several quarters. And so, gosh, that is, that is very, very That's hard. That's tough. That's tough yeah. for a company attempting to get to hundreds of thousands of daily transactions, mm -hmm. you know. And, and, you know, the challenge was free charge was, free charges systems needed to do more transactions outside of the stock exchange in India. Nobody did in India the number of transactions they were attempting to do. So who should you hire from, you know? The guys who are designing systems for 20, 30, 50,000 transactions a day are not the right people possibly. So it was very tough CTO search. Is that something that you guys were able to, to help with? Yeah, I think, you know, to a degree. Uh, it was a difficult problem, and, um, you know, it was a long process. Uh, there was, you know, the, the toughest challenges don't have a magic bullet, you know, that, oh, you know, here, I'll fire this magic bullet, and all your problems are solved next, mm -hmm. you know, on Monday morning. Yeah. You know, life is not like that. And it was a long process, which is why it took us 18 months. So uh, when we, I want to shift the focus back briefly to, to Southeast Asia. Sure. Uh, yesterday, there was the big news about Alibaba and Lazada. Yeah. Uh, lots of champagne bottles were, were popped, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, and there's some commentary that this is great proof that the EC uh, system in, in Asia is definitely valuable. It's worth investing in and just kind of this is a really positive thing for Asia as a whole. 
uh, how, how do you view uh, this particular uh, deal? How, how do you think it will impact the ecosystem as a whole? I, I think one thing it does demonstrate is that, you know, one strategic, and one strategic is not a trend, uh, and it's a single data point, believes that, you know, this market is uh, worth investing a big amount of, ch you know, big check in. And, um, you know, if many people were to do that, clearly it would, it would be further reinforcement. Um, look, I think overall it's a good thing. I mean, it's a good thing if foreign capital, foreign expertise from the markets which have seen really big and scalable companies will come help to build up companies here. Um, of course, I serve on the board of Tokopedia, and Lazada is a competitor. <laughs> and uh, uh, what we do for a living, you know, this is a very funny debate we have with our founders all the time and with lots of co-investors and other people, which is that, hey, are you worried that this big company is going to come crush your little company? Mm -hmm. And I always tell people, for a living, my job is to back the, the young founder or the underdog company to go beat the big incumbent. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it is in enterprise software or it is in payments or it is in e-commerce or somewhere else. So for a living, what we do is we believe that young and nimble companies that can innovate fast and that can you know, um, uh, have highly motivated uh, founder-led teams mm -hmm. will eventually always outcompete. you know, big uh, corporates, if you will. But not in 100% of the cases, yeah. but on average they will. So uh, on that point, uh, to, to be fair, you guys also had some very nice news with Tokopedia not so long ago. Yeah. So it's uh, two very strong companies uh, competing against each other. Uh, when we talk about uh, how this is one data point, uh, can I ask, what do you think is kind of necessary for there to be more such data points, uh, more uh, big M&As or, or more big IPOs uh, that kind of continue to fuel this, this growing ecosystem? Yeah, you know, we think it just happens on its own. Candidly, you, there's not a lot people can do about it. I think, you know, as companies make progress, like, you know, I, I have the good fortune of serving on the board of Gojek, which has been an amazing, you know, ride for us. We, uh, we agreed to invest last year in March. And the company has just blown past 20x of our forecast, already very aggressive forecast, right, in a year in Indonesia. But what's most gratifying is now bike taxis are being launched in India. Mm -hmm. And that market has never existed. Mm -hmm. And so to me, you know, MA and other things will happen that, you know, they'll happen as natural course. But I think what's even more important is, is innovation happening. Are companies mutating and creating new models, which are, which are relevant enough for Uber to copy? You know, that's a huge, uh, I think, extremely flattering for Gojek mm -hmm. that their success should prompt, yeah. you know, Ola and, and Uber to go launch a similar service in other markets. And to me, I think that's the, that's the one thing about emerging in, uh, investing in emerging markets that people don't fully understand. Mm -hmm. And I'll just double click on this a little bit and say whenever innovation happens, M&A will follow. Or whenever people build great companies, M&A will follow. But Oftentimes, people trivialize a company saying, hey, this is a clone. And this is X of Y or whatever they call mm -hmm. it, or you know, the Uber of X and so yeah. on and so forth. And we think really that that is a, is a trivialization that doesn't capture the value a company might deliver. And we prefer to call companies in three categories, mutants, mm -hmm. clones, and new species. OK. And, um, uh, OK, wait, OK, I, I'm, OK. Sure. So ha, let's start with mutants. Yeah. <laughs> So I think mutants is the most interesting category of, mm -hmm. of companies, which is basically that you know, when the problem statement is known, and it's a globally acknowledged problem statement, but the solution is not known, or you have created a new, call it a mutant or variant, which has some special powers, and the world doesn't fully know yet how to calibrate those powers. Those mutants tend to be, we think, what will define emerging markets investing and emerging mm -hmm. markets innovation. And the clones will almost always be very basic, very, um, very hotly contested because people will just try to follow a foreign playbook. And candidly, those result in bloodbath because everybody sees the same opportunity and everybody tries to apply what's relevant in one market mm -hmm. to another market. Like Gojek is a great mutant in our, in our uh, mind. Similarly, Oyo Rooms in India is a great mutant. You know, uh, and it's innovating on a new, new type of business model, which is somewhere blend between you know, uh, Uber and, uh, and um, Airbnb, but, but neither. Mm -hmm. um, and and those those companies are very interesting. So for we're just about out of time, which is a shame because I really enjoy uh, this chat. Uh, so I want to ask you the same question that I asked Nadim last year in Jakarta, yes. uh, and he had a really great answer, 
Uh, I'm really excited because I kind of am suspecting you're going to have a similar one, and I want to see what it looks like. Uh, what is, you have so many responsibilities, so many uh, boards, you have things that you have to do inside Sequoia. Uh, how do you approach the concept of focus and clarity? Yeah, it's a very, it's actually a much tougher question uh, than, than um, it's an easy question to answer in a minute. It's a very tough question to implement in everyday life. <laughs> <laughs> I'll buy that. Um, uh, candidly, I don't have a good answer. I think, I think what we tell our companies is, um, you know, it all starts with focus. Uh, but it need not end with focus. So point in time in companies' life, early years, you have to really perfect something. You have to be really, really, really good at something. If you do become really good at something, and that scales, and you get like a distribution uh, uh, engine going, let's say Gojek, then you may have a chance to defocus, if you will, or build a platform around it, and which is what Gojek is attempting to do now. So can Gojek become a platform company? Absolutely. If they hadn't been very good at one thing, if they hadn't focused initially, they wouldn't have the luxury today to launch these multiple product lines. So to me, the, the, now the, the question where, this is easy to say, but it's hard to know when to, when have you made enough progress that you can now attempt mm -hmm. a much bigger market opportunity. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we are constantly searching for the answers along with our founders. <laughs> well, sir, that's the final word. I uh, want to thank you once again for joining us. Uh, I know your schedule is so, so busy. So really, thank you. No, thank uh, you. It's a pleasure to be here. We for joining us here. Really uh, grateful for the chance to come and speak with you. Please give one more round of applause for Silenja.